we, we go through so many life events. You know, what, what troubles you at 20 is not what troubles you at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. These things change the whole time. Mm. And people who say, look, I don't need psychotherapy. I don't need to see a counsellor. I don't need to see a therapist. I always think in my mind, and what would happen if a parent were to die tomorrow? What would happen if you took seriously ill? What would happen if your spouse took seriously ill? Mm. What would happen if you were made redundant tomorrow? Would you still need to see a therapist? I mean, I never mm. say those things, of mm -hmm. course. Mm. But we're all liable to massive... Mm changes in our lives. It's not what happens, it's how we deal with it. Hello, I'm Sherry Jacobson and this is Therapy Lab, a podcast dedicated to therapy, thought and the art of mental well-being. In this episode, we are joined by sports psychotherapist and radio presenter Gary Bloom, to talk about how psychotherapy can help with mental health and his work helping sports people to achieve their aims. Gary, welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you very, very much for joining us today. I was wondering if we can start off with a quick well-being check. Right. How are you today on a scale of one to 10, one being the lowest, 10 being the highest? Gosh, I've never been asked that before. Um... I'd say a good eight because, um, yeah, I've had a great weekend so far. I went to a sporting event yesterday. The team that I'm, football team I'm working with won. It was all high fives and man hugs in the dressing room afterwards. So it was a good day so far. Very good. good weekend so far. Okay. And is that something that you do from time to time, check in with how you're doing? Maybe I should do it more. Mm. Um, I think as therapists, we often... Mm. Uh, work in a way whereby if things are okay, they're okay. And then sometimes we just kind of dip down and thinking, oh, that's interesting, what's going on there? So I had a really dippy day earlier this week and that set all those questions about what's going on for me uh, at that moment. Um, and then th the next question, and I'm sure you'd, you'd recognise this yourself, is, okay, I'm not feeling great today. Is this going to affect my work? because are we going to transfer that work into our client work? So I think that's a bit yeah. that I'm kind of concerned about. Yeah, and sort of aware of mm. as well. Tell us a little bit about your work, if you can. How, what are you doing currently? And then we'll, we'll go into how you got into it. Gosh, which bit do you want to know first? What are you up to right now? I'm sitting here with you. <laughs> so that, and therefore it takes us to the media work. I have a radio program on uh, Talk Sport called On the Sporting Couch. Mm. And that is a uh, psychological profile of well-known sportsmen and women. Um, and looking at how they've dealt with mental health issues throughout their sporting career. So uh, mm. that's the majority of my media work. Mm. I also speak at conferences and events. And then I have private client work. And then the rest of it is sports work uh, with a football club, but also sports clients uh, and a clinic in London once a week too. Mm. I'm very interested in this transition from working in the general field of sports mm. to um, to psychotherapy and, and integrating the two of them. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that evolved for you? Um, I've always, well, I've had a 30-year experience as a sports broadcaster. Mm. So I've had a whole wealth of knowledge about how, especially football works in the in the UK. Um, so that has been kind of part of my DNA, which I've brought to psychotherapy. And I, when I was training, I thought, well, I'm going to be a psychotherapist. I've got a sport thing going on. And they'll go on sort of like train tracks and never really meet. And somehow they just got muddled together, almost like different colours on a artist's palette. I just never experienced, never mm. had an experience like that before. Mm. And what I've created is something that I didn't even know existed and yeah. now learn doesn't exist. Yeah. So it's a, a relatively new field in, uh, in psychology. I've, I've called it sports psychotherapy. And it's actually looking mm. at what are the barriers to success for sportsmen and women. What things going on in their personal life, which they are struggling with, will they then take onto a, a golf course or a tennis court or a football pitch or a rugby pitch? And I must say it is an unusual combination because we're very familiar with sports psychology, which I would like to refer to as kind of performance based, like yeah. striving, etc. But without um, there necessarily being a focus on the mental health uh, aspects that, that may underlie. And in, 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 in fact, there's a growing um, 
amount of conversation about mental health within the sporting profession, but it seems to be a lot more kind of more recent that that's emerged, whereas before it was very much sort of like the, the sort of the emphasis on um, achievement um, based and results based. Um, yeah, I work. think that's true. Uh, I think we've had some very high profile cases mm. of where elite sportsmen and women have broken down mm. because there hasn't been that area to express their feelings. So what, I don't really want to go into the specific details or examples, but everybody knows if you have anything to do with sport about those high profile sportsmen who've just said enough is enough uh, and they've just been unable to deal with the pressures uh, of being a high level sportsman. You know. Mm. We all have enough pressures in our life anyway, but can you imagine doing that in front of 20,000 people, 30,000 people who are highly critical when things go wrong? Uh, it almost like puts a flame under those very difficult feelings. And unless you are able to cope with them or have ways of coping with them or have relationships where those are taken into, it's very, very difficult. Now we're just waking up to that fact, especially if you are hoping to take your sports performance from there to there, how do you add the extra 5%? What I find is actually working psychotherapeutically with sports people, there's quite a big difference and a very subtle change. Um, I think there's a book that's called, I can't remember what the exact title is, but what are the smallest changes we can make to have the greatest differences? Then I think that's possible in sports psychotherapy. Um, and so some of the pressures that are unique to the sporting field, um, you mentioned kind of large audiences and, mm -hmm. um, and live audiences as well. What are some of the other major challenges that you have come across? I think keeping the standard of performance mm -hmm. at a very high level is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the other big one is, uh, one of the big issues is what we call transitioning. When What happens when you leave the profession because you've become too old to play a professional sport at a certain level. Addictive behaviors are very, very rife. And interestingly, you know, in sport, mm. we've, we've got very good at drug testing. We've got very good at testing for a whole range of things. Mm. And that's why the big addictive problem in sport is gambling, because you can't test for it. Right. So gambling is right at the heart mm. of sport at the moment. And if you sp switch on any sporting event, on mm. a major sporting event on TV, mm. At the moment, you'll see lots and lots of gambling ads. So addictive mm. behaviours are in there. Fascinating. Staying at a certain performance level and also yeah. what happens when you get too old and your form begins to dip or you get overtaken by the younger guy or woman who wants to get in the team ahead of you. Right. So many, so many pressures. I'm interested in the, in the addiction side. What do you think drives addiction in sport? Exactly the same thing that drives addiction in everyday life. And it's interesting that yeah. through the, the radio show that I do, I often get contacted by people saying, look, I'm not a professional sportsman or woman myself, but I recognize the pressures of leading a, an organization or leading a group of people, and it brings exactly the same things out in me of feeling alone. It's lonely at the top, they say. That's a really good example for, a, say, a coach or a, a good football manager. They become so isolated because they've become so high up in an organization. Yeah. So I don't think these things are mm. particularly... Mm -hmm. um, just in sport mm. they're not exclusive to sport yeah. and anybody who's yeah. listening to this podcast or watching this podcast will say actually I recognise that I recognise what Jose Mourinho has gone through I recognise what an England football manager goes through I recognise what a top player goes through I recognise those addictive behaviours yeah. I recognise the depression I recognise the fact I can't do it every day what happens when I just get bored of it what happens when I'm so successful, nothing really turns my head anymore, mm. when I'm just so damn good at what I'm doing, mm. it doesn't really mm. float my boat anymore. I mean, all those things yeah. exist in sport, mm. but they also exist in, in non-sporting world, worlds as well. And is it possible to spot early signs before they develop into, in, into something more problematic? Or do you find that clients usually come to you at the stage where it, it is affecting their functioning? You see, this to me goes right to the heart mm. of the issue because there are sports organisations like the Professional Footballers Association and Rugby Players Association. All those mechanisms are in place. But my belief is, and this is just maybe a personal view, that by the time you access those services, it's already too late. You are really down what we call a, a decomposition spiral, almost going down the plug hole. We need to mm. sort it out before you start getting to that very low mm. level. So that when you think, actually, I'm just taking a drink too, too much, 
you know, my wife's complaining that I'm compli- you know, completely over, overdriven by these, uh, the, this stuff that's going on in my head. I, you know, I never take a break. I'm feeling exhausted. I'm feeling depressed. Those are the warning signs, all the classic warning signs that you and I would come across yeah. when we say to people, are you looking after yourself? Who's checking in on yeah. you? When does your office close? When, when, yeah. does you, when do you switch off your mobile phone? And when you start yeah. asking yourself those questions, that's the time when you need to start, even if you need just checking in with somebody. It doesn't, yeah. We don't need full-blown three times a week therapy just mm-hmm. to check in with somebody and check we're okay. So in other words, there, there, there is an advantage of, of working with a professional, professional support, even before something is troublesome in, in, in your life as a preventative measure? Well, I think that's true of everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we go through so many life events. You know, what, what troubles you at 20 is not what troubles you at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. These things change the whole time. Mm-hmm. And people who say, look, I don't need psychotherapy. I don't need to see a counsellor. I don't need to see a therapist. I always think in my mind, and what would happen if a parent were to die tomorrow? What would happen if you took seriously ill? What would happen if your spouse took seriously ill? Mm-hmm. What would happen if you were made redundant tomorrow? Would you still need to see a therapist? I mean, I never mm-hmm. say those things, of mm-hmm. course. Mm-hmm. But we're all liable to massive... Mm-hmm changes in our lives. One of the football club um, personnel said to me, we have five lightning strikes a year. A lightning strike is things we do not see coming. And my question would be, how do you deal with those five lightning strikes? It's not that they can't happen, they are going to happen. Maybe about five a year, sometimes three, maybe two. It's not what happens, it's how we deal with it. And do you have professional support? And when did you when did you first access it? Uh, I accessed therapy more than fifteen to twenty years ago, mm. and that was the kind of route that took me into being a psychotherapist. Right. Yeah. And now I access professional support mm. by being in therapy on a weekly basis, yeah. but also in something called yeah. supervision, which um, I'm sure people who are involved in the profession will know about. And supervision is when you take your work to maybe a more experienced or maybe a peer, and we just check in with the work I'm doing, not for somebody to say, oh, you've made a terrible mistake there, oh, you've got mm. that wrong, but somebody to say, that's, that's quite an interesting idea, but have you thought about this? What about another way of doing it? A metaphor might be, okay, you've got five gears f- for your car that you're driving, should we add another couple and see what happens? Mm. So you see a supervisor weekly, mm-hmm. presumably, and so you got into you you got into therapy, uh, the the profession, the study of the profession. As a result, do you think of your own experiences having been beneficial as a client? Um, that's a good question. I, mm. I don't know the answer mm. because things are happening unconsciously to us all the time. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. I knew I wasn't happy, and I didn't know why I wasn't unhappy. I mean, I do now, and I'm not prepared to go into that particular yes. uh, area of my life now, but I knew I was not right, and I would never, ever mm. be successful. And I don't just mean in terms of work, but I would never be successful in terms of, you know, my, as a human being, unless I resolved some of the things that were not right yeah. in my life. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, hopefully I'm in a better place, because I've been in a worse place. And I yeah. often say to clients, it's okay to be a good person, maybe because you've been a bad person and learning Mm. the difference between the two. I mean, that's Mm. where the humanistic side of of psychotherapy comes in. Now I'm gonna ask a really sort of complicated question, but how, what's the mechanism of therapy? How does it work? How does it work? How did it work for you? Because you've been on both sides of the Mm -hmm. the couch. What was the kind of the, how, how did it help in essence? If you can kind of break down what was useful to you and over what period of time, how long did it take? Well, the simple answer of, mm. of why does therapy work, there's a three-word answer. Mm. I don't know. And because anybody mm-hmm. who reckons they do know is, mm. is going into a theoretical area that's unproved. Mm. Listening mm. to somebody, just the act of listening to mm. somebody, in my, in my view, is therapeutic in itself. Mm. That act of being heard, I think, soothes a lot of people. And a Mm -hmm. client once said to me, he said, I don't know what you do, Gary, but just the fact I can come and talk to you about these things makes a difference Mm -hmm. to my life. Well, that's just one individual and one story that we've heard. Mm -hmm. I I think you have to trust, I mean, to people who are involved in psychotherapy, I would argue you just have to trust the process. Mm -hmm. Trying to work out why it works is a bit like trying to work out, does God exist? 
we can say yes, we can say no, it's unprovable. And for some people who buy into the process, I think it's more times than not mm. works. Now I'm really interested in, in how long you were in therapy for. Mm. Was it, have you had different therapists over, over the years? Mm. I was in therapy for about two years, mm -hmm. um, but that was before I started training. Mm -hmm. And it actually took me from one period of my life to another period of my mm. life. So it was very, very helpful mm -hmm. in terms of helping me. I mean, what is therapy? Her therapy, mm. in my opinion, is, is helping a client to look into their internal world. People who might not have access to their internal world. Yeah. But we as therapists need to understand how that works before we can help anybody. Yeah. We are, you know, we are yeah. spirit guides to help people into their internal world. And once you actually yeah. say to somebody, um, let's look at your internal world. My favorite one, you know, my, one of my favorite tricks, the uh, trick sounds, sounds rather not the right word, but my favorite things to say to somebody when we're having a really tough time in therapy, yeah. say, okay, we're gonna play a game. We're gonna play a game here. Let's pretend I'm the client and you're the therapist. And I brought exactly the same yeah. set of circumstances to you that you are bringing to me. What would you say to me? And they'd say, well, the answer's easy. I, I don't ever say anything back, yeah, okay. I'd tell you to that. I'd tell you to do this. I'd tell you to do the other. I just nod at them. They always have the answer. Yeah. And so um, you were in therapy initially for two years. Mm -hmm. I note that um, you're, you're listed on Counseling Directory, one of the kind of ways of accessing you and your services, and noting that you uh, were talking about shorter term work as well, that sometimes six sessions is what you would typically work for with, uh, with some clients for specific sets of issues. Long term, and uh, first of all, this is a really complex area of yeah. therapy because first of all, there's a financial issue. And also yeah. in terms of private medical care, certain health mm -hmm. insurers will only insure for six sessions. So we have to be aware that there's a financial mm -hmm. aspect to this. Without that, mm. I think it's being naive. Secondly, certain clients do not want to go necessarily to that deeper level. Yeah. Um, and I'll use a couple of metaphors here, which, which I sometimes use. Imagine that you have a, a plumbing system in, in, in this studio, okay? And there's, mm -hmm. there's pipes leaking all over the place. You might call me in and say, Gary, you're the plumber. Uh, I want to lag that pipe and stop it leaking all over my lovely carpets. And I can do that for you in a relatively mm. short space of time. Mm -hmm. And then we might say, okay, your pipes aren't leaking anymore. Your carpets are fine. We've dried out the place. Enough is enough. Or I can come and say, look, I've fixed your, the, the internal plumbing of the, your, your apartment, but we need to find out why this pipe started leaking. We need to look at the central heating system because if it doesn't, if it's not resolved here, it'll go somewhere else. And that is longer term work. Now in short term work, using a completely different metaphor, we tend to go around the harbour. We have a really good look around the harbour and we go and look around the beach and the other boats and everything else. We don't go out to sea. And I think it's really important, I as a therapist, that you don't take this out into a huge, huge fast existential expanse, we keep things nice and contained. Yeah. Is that helpful? It's very, very helpful. And this is obviously an analogy that you would, you would explain. Um, what, is the, what, what is the process of getting started with you? So how, how would an initial consultation start? And does the contact presumably start before? Is there any kind of discussion about what mm. they're going to, uh, what, what they would expect during that first appointment? I work, I don't know, different from other therapists. Mm. First of all, I, I try mm. to talk to my a new client on the phone and say, I wonder if I can help them. There are certain mm. conditions, presenting conditions that I don't deal with mm -hmm. um, because I think it needs a greater degree of understanding of that particular issue. Mm. And I'm thinking about certain addictions, eating disorders, that I think there are more qualified people than me mm -hmm. to work with that person. Mm. If I think I can help them, I will say to that person, let's meet once because you might not like me. You might just might not be the right flavour for you. Mm. So let's just meet once and see if we get on. And then if we do get on and that person wants to progress the therapy, I'll say let's do six and then review it after then. I think tying a client into long-term therapy is ethically very, very dodgy. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. keeping it nice and light, mm -hmm. making very clear opt-out stages, having boundary therapy mm. I think is, is, is quite important. Mm. And something that was said to me in training, always have the ending in mind. 
on every therapy session that you do. This is yeah. having open-ended long-term therapy, again, I think is unethical. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the, um, the, the the nature of your work, if, if we can talk about approaches for for don't for people who don't really understand or, or, or aren't really aware, there are different modalities yeah. within therapy. What which which branches did you study, and which do you integrate into your work currently? Yeah, well, interesting. You use the word integrate because I was trained integratively. I can't say that integratively. Um, that means that I. Integratively and humanistically are, are the two important aspects of my therapy. What do they mean? Well, integratively means mm -hmm. that I'm looking for the type of therapy that best suits the individual client. So I was trained in all modalities uh, when I was in the training process. Um, and I will often switch and change during a piece of work with a client depending on what they're bringing. If it's a here and now, you know, um, I've had a big row with my partner, I've had a big row with mum or dad, I might be looking at the here and now, then I might look more psychodynamically about the history of that person, what was going on when, when they were a young person. Maybe I will use art therapy because people are very locked into, into finding it difficult to access their feelings might need a different way of working. And I would work in mm. so many different ways. Mm. But you know what? And this, I hope this speaks to people who are training at the moment. Modalities are so important when you're training. You do psychodynamic, you do gestalt, you do integrative. You do this, you don't do that, CBT, and you're thinking, oh, you know, there's so many that we, we... When you're actually working as a therapist, I think it's irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. How I often work with people, mm. especially in the first one or two sessions, I'll work in a quiet, structured CBT way, cognitive mm -hmm. behavioral therapy. Let's just try and sort out the fixed the fixed pipe that's leaking. Yeah. Let's just help you just move off the square that you're on at the moment, just get there some momentum going forward. Because I believe mm -hmm. when clients feel there's some progress, the transference between you and that client begins to move. They begin to trust you. They begin to think, actually, that, mm -hmm. there's something going on here. And transference for those who don't know, how would you define that? They begin to start believing that the process works. They might mm. have a sense that I understand them, I hear them. Mm. So there's a beginning of a relationship mm -hmm. developing. Mm -hmm. If I were to yeah. sit down with many clients, say, oh, let's talk about your mother and your father, or let's talk about that painful period of your life when you didn't have any friends, they're going to close down. And that yeah. the relationship between me and that person, I think, is much, much harder. So for me to say, okay, let's yeah. just work out what's going on here. Let's just make you feel a bit better, that maybe you believe in the process, you believe in this is going to work, I think is a really helpful way forward. Yeah. Somebody once said to me, CBT, so cognitive behavioral therapy, some actual doing things that you can do to help yourself, is a really good framework to start therapy, almost like a clothes horse mm -hmm. to put some of your clothes mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And the clothes would be the sort of really big, heavy stuff. But let's yeah. create a little bit of a, you know, a structure, structure in there. Now you mentioned connection and that you also let your clients know that sometimes it's not the right fit in, mm. in a sense. Um, how, how I, I get asked this question a lot, how long, before, how long should you give it? How long should someone give it before they know if that, if that therapist is going to be suitable to work with them in terms of the, the connection? I think it's too difficult a question to answer. Mm. It could be five minutes, it could be five sessions. Mm -hmm. Because mm. if... And then you have to start thinking about why do we take against people? What's going on? What's the projection that's going on? What am I seeing in that person that I don't like? Well, my belief, yeah. theoretically, is if I don't like you, actually what I'm seeing is part of me I don't like. And maybe yeah. pointing that out to a client means that you are the right person, even though they're finding it hard to be with you. So it's possible to work through that and to, to get over that. Have you had that? Have you had examples of that where a client hasn't mm. taken to you initially, but you've you've managed to work past it or through it? Well, it's interesting you say that. Clients just come back to me after a two-year period, mm. and he really mm. found trust issues very, very hard. Mm. And he said to me, <laughs> I'm laughing at it now, but he said to me in session two, how do I know you're a real therapist? Because I've looked you up on the internet, and it says you're a sports commentator. I'm going, oh, no. I've lost it. And actually, he, that's been one of the most successful client-therapist relationships I've ever had because he had to get through this trust. And, of course, yeah. the trust, trust issue wasn't with me. It was everybody in his life. 
from mum, dad, girlfriends, peers, co-workers. So can you see how he thought I had somehow duped him, fooled him? But in essence, it was a trust issue that came to the fore. And, and by me helping point mm. that out, it became a really important piece of the work. And you were able to work with it and integrate it. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about your, your well-being habits and what well, do you do to keep well? Um, I'm embarrassed to say mm. I still play football at my age. And on a Wednesday lunchtime, uh, you'll find me with some much younger men, actually, who are much better at football, faster, quicker, more dynamic than me. But it's my way of just getting all out there, shouting, mm. screaming and laughing. I mean, I laugh so much and they all laugh at me and I tease them and they tease me. It's the best hour of the mm. week for me. That's great. And when I don't play, all those f frustrations yeah. get pent up. But also, yeah. I try to relax and I do exercises. I actually recently, and I've, I've poo-hooed this for years and years and years and years and years, I have a now um, a personal trainer who really encourages me to mm. do the work. Uh, I hated mm. all that stuff, but actually it's one of the best mm best uses of my time and money that I, I, I spend. To so exercise being really pivotal, and do you yeah. find the same with your clients? Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, somebody, uh, again, when I was training, somebody said, if we could put into a bottle what happens to our brain when we exercise, none of us would be sitting here trying to earn money because we'd just retire and be sitting in the Bahamas sipping yeah. cocktails. That thing that happens to our brain is absolutely crucial. And that's yeah. why exercise yeah. is so important for young people. If you're feeling, if you're not feeling great, yeah. just go outside, just go for a walk. It is a major, major benefit to you. Can we take it too far? Do you, do you come across exercise, over-exercise, exercise addiction, particularly given the, the field of work where, you know, in, in professional sports, where it is exclusively focused on that? Not often, but I have come mm. across it before. But actually, if somebody said they were addicted to over-exercise, I think I'd be interested in the feelings that they were mm. encompassing by the over-exercise. And I think what uh, it, in an episode of um, Sporting Couch on Talk Sport, mm. one athlete talked about the pain he actually enjoyed by over-exercising, that, uh, that feeling of feeling exhausted or his lungs mm. burning or the dizziness. That was an addictive uh, part of his personality and during the uh, one hour radio show he talked about his tattoos and I said oh he, he said mm. he said I've got lots and lots of tattoos and I said why I'm almost fascinated by tattoos I'm, I'm fascinated by what they say what they represent but this guy had a lot of tattoos and I said why have you got lots of tattoos and he says I love the pain of the tattooist actually applying the tattoo yeah. and actually the whole thing was about his addiction to pain and so, sort of the the, um, I mean, in in the in professional sports where the emphasis on exercise is all encompassing, is that verging on he healthy kind of addictive properties? Would you say it's like a, excessive, but accepted and certainly endorsed by a lot of a lot of people, and people will will watch it. But behind the scenes is. Is there any negative impact to focusing so wholeheartedly on just one activity? I think it's a really tough question, and I don't know the answer, because mm. are you talking about professional sport, or are we talking about amateur sport? Are we talking about those mm. gym bunnies who love being in the gym, mm. or are we talking about people who are dedicated to their profession? And mm. the 10,000-hour rule, for people who don't know the 10,000-hour rule, there is a general conception in sports psychology that if you practice for 10,000 hours, you'll be world-class. You know, ice skaters yeah. become world champions because they fall on their backside a, a thousand times. And that yeah. concept of practice, 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 yeah. practice is a part of mastering a sport. If you're saying that I'm not a professional but I'm addicted to running or I'm addicted to playing a particular yeah. sport, that to me is hmm. quite different. I guess what I have in mind is kind of the, the, the notion that we engage ourselves so fully into something because it is a diversion from something else that maybe need address it, maybe needs addressing. But that's that's an addiction full stop, isn't it? Mm. You know, this idea that we yeah. have these these mm. non -ex explicable urges to do something. But I think that's a mm. I think that goes into a much much bigger field mm. about addictive behaviours and what they mean. I mean, if you want to, the theory is that those. Mm. 
those addictive behaviors, those signals our brain is sending us are just false signals because they're saying, if you do that, you'll feel better. You know, you and I can say to somebody who mm. smokes 40 cigarettes a day, you do know that's bad for you. Mm. They're, going to, they're not going to turn around to you, Sherry, or me and say, oh, you know what, that's a great idea, I'll stop smoking. It's the addiction, what we're, we believe is going to happen by doing that particular thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's about how our brains work. Um, and so just generally what's on the horizon for you doing more of more of your psychotherapy work and yeah more yeah. psychotherapy work yeah. more sporting work there's a there's mm -hmm. lots of projects that I'm often contacted about which you know people I say often say to me what are you good at and I'm just said you know I don't know I've no idea if there's a skill if there's a whatever but I'm curious about everything and when you have that curiosity yeah. I think things just come into your life that you can have a look at, decide whether you want to be involved with them, decide if you're not going to be involved with them. Um, and I often say to, to, to clients, you know, think of life as a buffet table. You know, you don't have to eat everything. You can have a little mooch around and have a little bite of this and a bite of that and decide what is for yeah. you. And just because somebody says you have to eat those things there, you don't have to. Try it and see what happens. Don't be frightened of trying stuff. But don't feel you have to do it either. That's a wonderful analogy, wonderful way to end. Thank you so much for joining us, Gary. Really appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much for having me. If you feel you'd benefit from therapy and want to transform your life, HarleyTherapy.com is here to help you book counseling with qualified professional therapists online or in person at times and prices that suit you wherever you are in the world. If this is your first Listen to Therapy Lab, do hit subscribe to keep up to date with new episodes. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and listen at HarleyTherapy.com forward slash Therapy Lab. We'll see you next time.